Here in the United States, we're very familiar with Saracenia, American pitcher plants, and Darlingtonia, the cobra plant. But did you know that they actually have a South American cousin? So yeah, the botanical family Saraciniaceae actually has three genera in it. Saracenia, for which it's named, the American pitcher plants, Darlingtonia, which is the cobra plant, and then these weird space alien pitcher plants, the Heliamphora. Heliamphora, and that's pronounced differently. We say Heliamphora around here. In Europe, I've noticed they say Heliamphora, but no matter what you wanna, how you wanna pronounce it, these guys are just so bizarre and otherworldly and also amazingly beautiful. So I want to take a few minutes and really uh, talk about them as far as like, you know, just basically teach you guys a little brief lesson for those of you who've never heard of them. So first off, let's talk about Heliamphora. Their common name is called the Sun Pitchers. And what's really funny about that is that's all because of a mistranslation. So when people were looking for some easy thing to call these, because there was really no common name for these, common names are really dependent on people interacting with that plant and being like, oh, this is that thing over there. That's where common names come from. Like Christmas tree or apple, you know. But these guys come from such a remote place, there was no common name for them. And so when people started to grow them and they wanted to figure out what to call them that wasn't Heliamphora, they were like, oh, well, Helios means sun, so let's call them the sun pitchers. What's really funny, though, is it wasn't from the root Helios. It was from Helos, which means marsh. And so really, if there was any justice in the universe, these would be the marsh pitchers. Regardless, again, beautiful. So let's talk about that remote place where they come from. They are native to Venezuela and Guyana on these magical special mountains called the Tapuis. Most of us don't have much reference for that, but The Lost World, written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, took place in the Tapuis because it's such a crazy remote place. And if you've ever seen the animated movie Up, the mountains that the old guy flies away to with the balloons were actually the, the Tapuis. And these weren't there in the movie, but they should have. I was looking, where are the helium for it? They should be up there. Um, so these mountains are plateaus with flat tops. They stick up out of the sweltering jungle below up to like three or 4,000 feet, totally surrounded by a sheer drop cliff. Uh, and they were formed by the erosion of the world. And so the plants that were stranded up on top when that was the, rep, the level of the soil, as that slowly got eroded down over millennia and millions of years, what were trapped and isolated up there were things like these Heliamphora. Weird things happen to plants when they're isolated. There are entire branches of biology about what happens when plants are on islands. You know, tortoises get giant, birds lose their flight. All kinds of weird things happen in those really isolated places. And this is a very isolated place. The things that are, exist up on top of the Tapuis do not generally exist below. There are helium forest species, two of them, that are in the lowlands. Heterodoxa is one. I think there's a second one. Uh, maybe there's just one of them. But there are a couple of them down in the lowlands. You guys who are the correctors can rush down and put in the messages what they are if there's another one I'm forgetting. There's a lot to keep up in this old login. But the rest of them are all up on top of the Tapuis, where it's completely different and isolated from below. One of the things that's really weird up there is the weather. So we think of the tropics as a hot, sweltering place, and down at the base of these mountains, it is, which is why heterodoxa can generally take uh, warmer temperatures. But at the very top, it's cold. It's really cold. The hottest day that might happen up there would be like 60, maybe 70 degrees Fahrenheit would be a sweltering day on top of a tapui. And at night, dropping down into the high 30s sometimes, but reliably the low 40s, all Fahrenheit. So that's very, very cold for a tropical place. And yet it never, ever actually freezes. And so these are not cold hardy plants that can never freeze or get below, I would say you want to keep them above, for, above 40 degrees just to be safe. But they could take high 30s, like I said. The other thing that's crazy about that place is the rain. It is one of the absolute rainiest places on earth called a rain desert. 
I'm sure you guys know what a desert is. It's very dry and a hard place to live. A rain desert is a place that gets so much rain that it's a hard place to live because of that. So here in Sonoma County, we probably get like this much rain here if we're lucky. Um, I used to live in Borneo, right on the equator in the jungle. There we would get like 17 feet of rain a year, which is a little bit taller than this greenhouse. But in the Tapuis, they get 50 to 90 feet of rain a year, which is, you know, a five to a 10 story tall building. And so everything gets washed away off the sides of those cliffs. Everything, almost all the dirt is gone. It's just these rounded black rocks that have been eroded for millions of years. And the plants are just always inundated with water. In the wild, very often, some of these will even go like halfway underwater, maybe even completely underwater for short periods of time where all the water drains away. So the plants have to contend with all these things. <clears throat> so their morphology or the way they're shaped is dictated by that. Instead of a lid, because Saracenia have a rain lid and so do Nepenthes, which are not related, but are a pitcher plant. Very oftentimes pitcher plants will evolve a lid. I'd say basically always have a lid, with the exception of Purpurea, Saracenia purpurea. Um, to keep the rainwater from flooding and washing out all the nutri nu uh, nutrients that they're catching from the bugs. So the Heliamphora are contending with too much rain for a rain lid. So they have this nectar spoon instead, where nectar is, um, you know, extruded for, to draw in the prey, and that way it doesn't get washed away. It's under this beautiful little bell. Also, how are we going to keep ourselves from being always just so full of water that we can't catch any bugs? Because obviously... They'll just swim to the top and crawl on out. It's almost impossible to see on camera, but I do think right here in that little slit right there at the top, there's a little opening with interlocking silvery or gold hairs that lets the water out to keep them always full at about midsection, no matter how much rain they get. And the little hairs keep the prey from being washed out too. And so there's a lot of really cool evolutionary things about them. They also have super beautiful snow white little flowers like this. They're just so pretty and very waxy. Plants don't ever flower. Well, let's see. I should say flowering is one of the most expensive things that a plant does. It's like, I always compare it to like pregnancy for a woman. You know, some plants will just die during the flowering phase, like an annual plant. Um, so it's very expensive. And we're not catching a lot of bugs up there. It's not a rich environment. Like I said, it's basically a desert. And so the few bugs that they catch, and they're just always trying to get enough bugs to get enough fertilizer to make one of these flowers. And when they do, they don't want to waste the pollen, making a whole bunch of expensive pollen that's not going to make it exactly to that flower. And they get around that by having a very interesting and complicated pollination mechanism, which is the anthers up here will not release their pollen unless they get the specific vibration of their pollinator's wings. And that guarantees that just the right bug is going to vibrate that pollen out that they know is going to another helium for a flower to do that job of reproducing their species and making seeds. So that's very cool and intricate. That's one of the things I love about plants is they're all about energetics. And the more severe that environment is, the more you can really see that plants don't do anything for no reason. There are about 27, well, let's say about 25 different taxa of Heliamphora. That is changing all the time. When I was a little boy, I think there were only four species of Heliamphora known. That's because only one of these tipuis can be scaled on foot, and that's Roraima. The others, in which there are several, have to be, um, you have to get a helicopter to go to the top of those. And so the people, like Andreas Westuba, is the one who's discovered many, many species of these and named them. He has to take a helicopter from Venezuela somewhere to the top of this tapui. They usually get left there for four or five days in all that rain and all that cold and pitching a tent on the black rock um, and running around trying to see as much botanizing as you can and discover these species. And so just in my lifetime, almost all of these species have been discovered. Let's just go through some that are really amazing and cool. Um, this one is Heliamphora cerasiae, cerasiae. This one is totally glabrous and has no hairs, both inside and out, which is really different. All the, all the rest of them have little hairs on the inside 
um, that actually I think McDonald's doesn't have it very much either, but most of them, let's say, have little hairs on the inside that point down and kind of guide the prey into the picture. Um, so that's what makes that one super interesting. This one comes from uh, Neblina, the mountain Neblina, uh, and so, or Neblina, so I pronounce that, I'm sorry. Like I said, a lot of things keep on my head. Um, only one little spot on the top of Neblina, very small range, does this plant exist. This is the old Jeff Wong clone that came from him. This is McDonald Day, probably arguably the most beautiful. Here's another one. That venation on the inside is just really super hard to beat. That one down for a second. Let's see, what else have we got here? I think this is a parva. It is. <laughs> this is a helium for a parva. This one often has like really white hairs on the new growth there, but also on the outside of the pictures. This beautiful, um, almost flag of a nectar spoon. That one's really super nice. I don't know, what else do we have around here? This is Heterodoxa by Ionaceae, which is a really beautiful hybrid that's been around for a long time. The hybrids on these are a lot easier to grow. So if you're looking for something to grow, the species are definitely more difficult than the hybrids. I would say the hardest species is Tadeye. Parva is not that easy either. Saracenioides, not very forgiving either. This is a beautiful hybrid that we made here. This is Tadeye by Folliculata, getting really exceptionally large. Tadeye is a huge species, Folliculata not so much, but I think we're all surprised at how big that's getting here. There's Folliculata. Folliculata has this crazy little bean of a nectar spoon in there, and that's actually kind of like hollow inside, and there's usually nectar in there, and it has this kind of strange bean-shaped, kidney bean-shaped mouth, so they're very um, interesting looking in form. I believe that's Ionaceae back there. There's another one in the distance there. But Ionaceae is one of the, if there's a number two most beautiful species in my opinion, it's probably that one. A big flared opening, you know, golden hairs, just super, super beautiful plants. They are a little tricky, like I said, to grow. So these are not for the beginners. These are definitely the advanced um, Jedi plants to grow. Um, because of that, um, you know, special place they come from, they hate a hot day. Heat is the enemy of these. So if you live in this extremely hot place, these are going to be very challenging for you. And it gets colder at night up there. And so these also want a real shift in temperature from day to night. So up to like 60 during the day and dropping back down to 40 at night, really reliably. Here in Sonoma County, we have coastal fog that does that for us, even on the hot days. So we kind of cheat by living in a place with a similar climate. Honestly, a, a spring day in Sonoma County is probably pretty similar to being up on the Tapuis. But again, if you're in sweltering South Florida, you're gonna have to do some things to cool it off. And it might even be impossible, honestly. The hotter it is, the harder it is. They also appreciate a great deal of light they're best grown under artificial light, I would say. They do really well in terrariums, as long as you don't let them get too hot. And we'll do a deep dive ultimate care guide on helium for it soon, because I know that you guys are really super asking for that all the time. And those are really popular videos around here. So I'm not gonna go on and on about care, but just to give you a rough idea that they're probably not the easiest plants to grow. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed learning about this um, spectacular group of plants with me. Um, it's always such a delight to share these plants I love with all of you.